everybody. Happy Thursday. Thanks for joining us for our monthly flex series for the month of September. I know we're probably working on our uh, seventh or eighth one, and, and I'm really excited about today. Um, you know, I think we have uh, an excellent subject matter expert on all things mortgage that uh, is going to share some insights with you as we kind of look past the pandemic, right? Obviously, we're not through it by any stretch of the imagination, but as we start to return back to you know what will be the new normal, um, I think we're going to share some thoughts with you today around what you can do as an originator, set yourself up for future success, right? So really excited about today's guest. And, and before I you know, kind of give you an introduction to, to him and bring him on stage, look, one, as always, thanks for taking the time, trying to keep these things quick and to the point and bring you uh, value that can help you in, in your business as you move forward. Two, like I've always said before, hopefully this finds you, all of your loved ones, healthy, safe, obviously. But like I said earlier, we're by no stretch of imagination are we through um, this pandemic as we see different variants popping up and things like that. So obviously, you know, from Flagstar, myself to all of you, hopefully you're, you're, you and your loved ones are doing well and, and, and staying safe. Um, so, you know, let's get into it. Um, I, I've been fortunate enough to know uh, our guest speaker today for a very long time. Um, I, uh, I don't know if he, I say this to people, I've said it to him before, I kind of feel like our guest is like Bill Walsh type of thing with a coaching tree. And he's got a lot of people that were, you know, that he's influenced in some form or fashion. Uh, I count myself as being one of them when I first started back in this industry back in 1994. As, as when I had a chance to, you know, obviously work for uh, Dave in his organization, and and you know, to give you an introduction to to Dave Stevens, obviously, um, I would hope most people know who Dave is, but in case they don't, Dave's a 38 year veteran in this industry. Um, he is currently the CEO of Mountain Lake Consulting, but if you go back through Dave's history, and and I'll start and go kind of in reverse order. Um, you know, he was a group senior vice president at World Savings, which is where I had the pleasure of meeting Dave for the first time. He was also then a senior vice president in charge of single family lending back at Freddie Mac. He then was an executive vice president of wholesale lending at Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. He then uh, went on into a career in and outside of the Beltway, so to speak. Um, he was the president and chief operating officer for Long and Foster uh, real estate companies here in uh, based out of the you know Northern Virginia area. He served as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Housing and Federal Housing uh, Commissioner at HUD, and um, he was also where a lot of people, uh, if you hadn't met Dave through all of that or been influenced by Dave through all that. He served as the president and CEO of the Mortgage Bankers Association prior to uh, his current role, CEO of Mountain Lake Consulting. So um, with that, I'm, I'm excited to have Dave here. Let's let's bring Dave on to stage. Hey, good to be with you. Hey, uh, buddy, what's going on, man? How you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's always good catching up with you and uh, seeing how successful you've been in your career. So um, good to be joining you and the Flagstar team. Um, yeah, hey man, we, we appreciate it, Dave. I, I I told you I joke around all the time. There's part of that Dave Stevens tree, and I think you you've certainly influenced a lot of people that you might not even realize. And I think I joked around about it on a podcast I did. There's a moment in time in my career, and I'll never forget this. We were at the Poconos, and I think it was like World Savings Sales Skills Two or something like that. And you were kind of running the whole East Coast. Yeah. And I remember I won the flip chart presentation contest of all things. Yeah. And I sat down in my seat and you were talking, I think it was like Wibag and Fitzpatrick and a couple other people were there. And you said something that was pressing to me that probably altered a path and you don't even know, which was, hey, he's got all the talent in the world. He's just not working hard enough. Uh, and like literally something simple like that trajected me down a whole different path. So I give you credit for a lot of what I've accomplished in my life because I think you kind of turned a 23 year old around at that time. So thanks for that criticism at the time. <laughs> Uh, well, great memories, I guess. <laughs> That's right, buddy. Um, well, hey, man, excited to have you here. Obviously, you know, your topic, I know you want to talk about a lot of different things, you know, as we move forward versus looking backwards. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time. And, and obviously, I think a lot of our business partners, originators will obviously walk away with some pretty good takeaways from this. So um, let's get started. 
All right. Well, I, I'm going to share a deck, uh, Dana. If you could pull the deck up, um, I, I'm going to walk you through just some uh, a few slides I put together to help give you all a picture of what the market looks like today. Um, I'm hoping it works, but uh, we'll find out in just a moment here. Um, <laughs> the uh, the data in this deck are from some of the world's top economists, the nation's top economists, um, who. Fortunately, through relationships I built when I work in the, worked in the Obama administration, have uh, our, remain t close relationships today, and they send me good stuff that is really invaluable for our industry. Um, so let's let's kick this off. Um, where are we? Right. Uh, no matter where you look, the economy is uh, is hot, and we can talk about jobs numbers that were just released. I don't think it's relevant. Um, the economy is, is growing, uh, and you, you read it everywhere on the top left. The economic recovery is here. It's unlike anything you've ever seen. Top right, the summer will be hot for the U.S. economy. 2021, we'll see the most growth since 1951. Um, and then, obviously, a picture of our favorite Fed Chairman Powell down on the bottom right, who we're all wondering, when is tapering going to kick in? Uh, and, and because that ultimately has a big impact on interest rates and refis in particular. Uh, this is from Mark Zandi. He's the chief economist from Moody's Analytics. Moody's is really important because they're the biggest ratings agency uh, in this nation, but they rate global debt, sovereigns, munis, corporates, everything. And Mark, as their chief economist, is highly regarded inside Washington. He was John McCain's uh, chief economist when he ran for president, but he works on both sides of the aisle. Um, this is his view about how jobs are going to look going forward. And I want you to just look at the gray zone. Uh, that's sort of where we are now. And these steps are steps along the way. But as you see, quickly moving us out of the pandemic, as fast as we went into it, we, we came out of it almost as fast. Granted, we're not done yet because of all this uncertainty around COVID. Uh, but the economy is still roaring back pretty strong. Um, and a lot of it's due to stimulus, right? We had the American Rescue Plan, the original relief package, the American Rescue Plan, um, we had the Build Back Better plan. That's the infrastructure plan, which is being uh, literally finalized as we speak over these next days. Um, and then you'll see an important uh, arrow there where, uh, at least for Professor Zandi, he says the Fed's going to taper QE. That's a critical moment for all of us to begin thinking about. Um, beginning to taper isn't rate normalization, right? If you go down out to the far right, you see where he expects that to happen out a, uh, a year and a half to two years out. But tapering QE means slowing down the purchases of mortgage-backed securities. Uh, that'll take out the biggest buyer of MBS in the marketplace. Uh, the supply will still be relatively strong, and uh, that will drive uh, rates up, prices down on bonds. It's just a matter of when that occurs. And I know we all keep sort of wondering what's going to happen. It's been an odd couple months here with the 10 year uh, went up for a little bit and then it dropped back down. You all have pretty good pipelines, but we'll get to that in just a moment. No matter where you look, it's a quick recovery, right? This is uh, the left is employment, the right is GDP. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the reality is that the economy is growing very fast. In fact, GDP is growing faster than jobs. And the only reason that's happening is uh, you just can't overnight add that many jobs to the workforce um, because during COVID, people became dislocated. They moved to different locations. They're not necessarily enough volume of, of eligible employees in urban markets and industrial centers right now. Uh, they need to go back there for the jobs. And we'll see that move forward as time goes on. But all of this means that, you know, we're seeing inflation, right? Prices are spiking, uh, both commodity prices and industrial prices. And this doesn't take us back just to the Great Recession. This is taking us all the way back to 1995. Um, we have a hot inflation ridden uh, U.S. economy, at least for the time being, that's at a pace higher than probably any of you guys have seen uh, in your career, at least the vast majority of you. And it has a lot of impact. A lot of impacts. Here, here's one example. Um, look at auto production. So um, on the right, auto production is hobbled. Um, if you look at the green line, that's production. Obviously, all the factories shut down during COVID. They weren't considered essential workforce. Um, and now they're reopened. Uh, but production is still not able to get back up to full speed. 
and inventories are, are, are low. And you're hearing the stories, right? Chip manufacturers, they were also gone. We just can't produce enough of the, uh, uh, of the sub products that need to be built into American vehicles. And so as you see on the left, this vehicle prices jump. This is just one microcosm of the U.S. economy. You see it in housing. Same deal with inventory, but it's 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 running across the entire U.S. economy. One other thing that's really driving this market is um, is the amount of cash that sits in uh, in American pocketbooks right now. This is a a measure from um, uh, Moody's, um, and it's it's an interesting look at the accumulative excess savings across the in dis income distribution chain of the United States in billions of dollars. And the reason why I think this is important is if you look back at January of 20, before we all shut down for COVID, Americans really were terrible savers. We had very little pent up demand, or excuse me, pent up cash uh, for spending. Um, a, a, a majority of Americans lived paycheck to paycheck. But during COVID, um, People ended up not traveling. They weren't out buying uh, second homes, at least in any great measure. Um, they weren't buying the big goods and services. A lot of manufacturing stopped, so they just couldn't go buy supplies. People stayed at home and hunkered down uh, during COVID. And as a result, they saved. And uh, we now have a massive amount of cash sitting in pocketbooks uh, in American piggy banks across the country. And I can assure you, America is a nation of spenders they're gonna spend this money. Again, stimulation point number two, not only is it supply and demand of goods and services, uh, it's literally just pent up cash, which is gonna go, which wants to be spent uh, in the US economy. This is our risk point. Uh, this is what we don't know what's gonna happen. Um, low vaccination rates are a risk. Uh, and this gives you state by state, but we all know where the hot spots are. We're gonna hear a speech from the president uh, this afternoon at five o'clock Eastern, but. Um, where he's going to mandate all federal employees get vaccinated, and I don't know what else will be included. But this is the only thing hampering the recovery uh, in terms of longevity of the recovery in the U.S. economy, and is supporting strains uh, being advances being advanced. But let's go back. Let's let's go back to the market and just say, okay, where are we and where are we going? The first thing you need to realize is the Fed erected a massive firewall uh, to support the U.S. economy during the pandemic. Now, this shows the Fed's engagement in the U.S. economy going back to the Great Recession of 08. And as you can see from 08 uh, to, to current environment, uh, the Fed stepped in and bought MBS and agency, which is that sort of orange color, and treasuries. Those are the two most predominant purchase uh, activities that they got into. There were three rounds of QE uh, from 08 to early 2020. The Fed was actually tapering. You can see the orange line was beginning to slow uh, between 2019 and early 2020. The Fed was actually slowing purchases and trying to unload assets that they're holding. Obviously, COVID hits and they double down and go in full guns a blazing. And you guys remember, right, when the nation shut down in uh, mid-March of last year um, and then suddenly the Fed jumps in. And uh, all your hedge pipelines, well, at least not maybe all of yours, but I can guarantee for every lender that you may sell uh, mortgages to, um, your hedge pipelines blew up uh, because um, suddenly rates plummeted and there were a lot of call, margin calls on pipelines. But, you know, fortunately, the, real, the, the, the reality is the Fed drove rates into the twos. You refinance the entire universe of Americans and you had a ton of millennials coming out to buy homes. And between the two of those things, it's been a massive volume period, particularly over the last six quarters. And the thing that I would I would suggest to all of you is this will not continue. Um, I speak to so many LOs who came into the business after 2007. And if you've been in this business since 2007, which is a, a, a ton of our industry, you just never have been, lived in a world where the Fed hasn't been involved in your life. The Fed buying, intervening this aggressively and buying this much in mortgage-backed securities is a sign of an unhealthy economy. It's a truly sick economy. And that's uh, the reason why they're engaged so heavily. And as quickly as this economy recovers, it's only a matter of time before the Fed begins tapering their purchases. And again, it's a matter of when. In the meantime, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in D.C. outside of your business and outside of what the Fed does. Uh, Mark Calabria is no longer heading the FHFA. 
That's really important in terms of the GSEs. Sandra Thompson already eliminated the 50 basis point refi fee that Calabria put on. Uh, Sandra's the acting director. But um, on top of it, they've uh, got a bunch of rules they need to roll back. Uh, you, you're probably most aware of the second home limitation and the two to four limitation. That's why you saw a spike in rates for both second homes and two to fours after January uh, of this year when Mark, uh, when, when, when this uh, amendment to the preferred stock purchase agreement That's went right. into effect. Um, but there's other aspects that uh, of rulemakings that are much more complicated because they're contractual in this document called the Preferred Stock Purchase Agreement, which is the governing document that holds Fannie and Freddie in conservatorship. I am certain that the FHFA is working on all of these things, the, cash, uh, the limit on cash sales, the two of three factor underwriting rule, second homes, two to fours. Um, but it takes a little time because Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, has to also agree to a modification to that document. The Department of Justice and the Attorney General have to agree because it's a legal document and they're the lawyers for the federal government. And then the boards of Fannie and Freddie respectively have to hold meetings and vote in favor of an amendment. So they will they will uh, be wound back. I'm certain of it. It's just a matter of when. A lot of other stuff though. Ginny May has a, a crazy capital proposal on mortgage servicing rights uh, that would absolutely raise rates for Govy loans, FHA, VA, USDA, uh, something that I know the MBA and the other trade groups are actively engaged in. Uh, we have a huge infrastructure bill, which right now is, you know, heading its way towards reconciliation. It's already passed its way. It's uh, passed in the Senate. It's, um, uh, it's, it's working its way through the House. There'll be a reconciliation process. There's also a budget bill on top of that. But I, one thing that's a little scary in these bills is they're, they're looking at G fees right. as pay-fors uh, for efforts, and it's written into the legislation as it stands now. And frankly, I believe we've lost that battle, and I think there will be this 10 basis points it's written in. Um, we have an appraisal discrimination effort headed by Secretary Fudge, but a lot of big names in D.C. are working on it. And then we got a bunch of housing bills, uh, first-time uh, uh First-time home buyer bill from Maxine Waters in the House. Uh, Senator Warner from Virginia has a bill called Lift in the Senate, which is a different kind of housing bill. Uh, Blumenau, who's on the Ways and Means Committee, has a, has a down payment assistance tax credit bill. And then the White House just in the last few days introduced their complete housing plan about how to create more affordable housing units. So good or bad, there's a lot of focus on our industry uh, that's going on in D.C., and it's why it's really important also for industry to be engaged. So let me tell you what you already know. The housing market is severely undersupplied, uh, and the supply shortage is intensifying. Um, without going into a lot of depth, all I would just say is uh, we haven't seen uh, this shortage of housing units, this low in inventory of housing units in terms of month supply going back decades. And uh, so this is a really unique time. You know it all too well in terms of what's happening. Um, to get a home, you got to be superhuman, right? You got to have a big down payment. Non-contingent is best uh, if you can. Be ready for bidding wars on good homes. Um, and the articles are showing it, right? Home buyers in 2021 need more cash, face more competition. The Wall Street Journal reported a month ago, many home buyers, a 5% down payment is enough. In fact, over half of all home buyers put down 25% or more. How hard is it to buy a home right now? Beyond crazy and frustrating. Uh, this is what you you know, you know all know too well. Your buyers are facing that. Um, and that's a big deal. And that's causing this massive home price appreciation that we're seeing in this country. So this is CourtLogic's data. It came out uh, day before yesterday. Um, this is month over month, August over previous year. Um, and as you can see, year over year, home prices appreciated. 18%. Totally unsustainable, out of control, home price appreciation. If you look forward in terms of what they expect home price appreciation to do, they're looking at closer to a 3% year over year rate going into next year. Guys, you should view this as a good thing. Uh, any economist will tell you that home price appreciation needs to be in line with wages. Uh, when you get way out of the box, like we've been in over this last year, you're headed towards problems in the housing market. Uh, so the fact that this is going to normalize is a positive thing. And the fact that it's a positive number is an important one to, to be aware of. 
One thing I'll just emphasize, this isn't from last, this, the report from two days ago, but this is from a previous CoreLogic report. Uh, but it's, it's an important fact about the refinanceable product that is still there. Granted, really hard to sell someone into a three when they have a two and a half or a two and a quarter. But keep in mind, home equity has more than doubled over the past decade uh, and is a crucial buffer for many weathering challenges of the pandemic. And if you look down below on the far left um, under national homeowner equity, just in the first quarter of this year, just the first quarter, the average homeowner gained approximately $33,000 in equity uh, during the past year. So we've got a boatload of equity sitting in people's uh, homes. And the question is, how will well-skilled, talented loan origination personnel uh, work with their Rolodex of previous refinancers and home buyers and show them how they can unleash that equity for investment opportunities to pay off debt, invest in college futures and more? Uh, because that's going to be the one place where there's really strong refi opportunity. It just requires stronger selling skills uh, to be able to unleash it. But it's interesting that CoreLogic uh, identifies that. As to inventory, guys, you know, we've all been talking about the price of lumber and the price of cement and metals and more that are raising the cost of new homes. That is certainly uh, looking like it's beginning to ease. So this is from Rob Dietz. Uh, Rob is the chief economist for the National Association of Home Builders. Um, on the left is single family housing starts and builder confidence. Don't look at the short ups and downs that can be due to anything like a short month or a bad weather month or whatever. Um, and don't certainly don't look at that pandemic dip. Look at the trend line going back to 2013. The trend line is up. Single family housing starts continue to improve. Uh, the home builders are building. And the good news is that lumber prices are easing again. So uh, you heard about that package that the, the fixed costs you had to consider adding on to the price of a new home of about $33,000. Uh, recently. Well, that's because the CME future prices, that's random length lumber prices. That's literally the index that includes two by fours for building homes. Um, went from about 600 up to 1700 uh, and people were freaking out. Um, frankly, in Canada, uh, lumber workers were not considered essential workers. They weren't even cutting trees during most of COVID. Um, and that's where a major chunk of our lumber comes from, the Pacific Northwest and Canada into the United States. Well, all of, if you look at the futures prices now, um, they're, they're dropping down. And that's a really good sign for anybody who's looking to build homes or look at the future of new construction because homes will recover. So if any of chart uh, that I'm going to walk you through is important, this one's the one. All right. So this is America. This is every age cohort of America from zero to 100 uh, laid out as of 2019. We, um, uh, if we look at the peak first time home buyer year in the United States, it's age 34 or 35. The realtors say it's 34, the MBA says it's 35. I put a red line there. That's the peak first time home buying year. This is why you have millennials coming out of the woodwork to buy homes. Um, it's not just the low interest rates, it's that we're in peak, the peak demand cycle of the biggest generation in the history of this nation. Now look to the left, look at every year coming at us for the next decade. They're either gonna be the same as this year in terms of demand or bigger. And in some cases, significantly bigger if we look out four or five years from now. Um, people ask, say, well, how, how come we're not gonna have a crash like 2008? Well, 2008 was uh, about 13 years ago, right? If you go to the right from age 34 uh, to 47, just sort of run your eyes over to the 45 plus age group, that's Gen X. That was a smaller generation. It was smaller than the millennial generation to its left and the baby boom generation to its right. Um, we actually had a loss of housing demand hitting us right when the Great Recession hit. And that's why home prices drop. This environment is entirely different. We are going to have the best home purchase years, you are, uh, that you'll ever have in your career. And these will be the best years that mortgage lending has ever seen since the early 1980s when the baby boomers started buying. You can't stop it. It's demographics. It's factual. And that's why all the forecasts say, you know, we are in for a really strong economy driven by housing. Um, you know, it, 
look at where people are talking about their views of the market. All in stock buy alert on Motley Fuel, uh, Fool. Stay bullish and buy dips in the S&P because we'll keep grinding higher. Opinion, the bull market in stocks may last up to five years. Here are six reasons why. By the way, number one on that list is housing. Um, we have just a very inflationary economy that's going to grow, fueled particularly in the housing market by millennials who are reaching their peak years to come out and buy homes. So I'm going to sh share with you two last slides about forecast. This is from Moody's. Um, this is from Mark Sandy's most recent presentation. Uh, but you can see what he's looking at. The the red line is his forecast on fixed rates going out for the next several years. You can see we dipped obviously down sub three. Uh, he expects it to go up north of 5% uh, over the next few years. Um, but purchases really don't aren't maligned, right? If you look at the purchase uh, purple or blue, whatever that is, that continues cruising along really nicely. Refis are going to get crushed. And if you look at those peaks in refis and refis uh, from last year in particular, last year was the biggest year uh, in mortgage origination history matched only by 2003. Um, and this year is going to be a really good year as well. But we're going to see overall volumes drop. And so bear with me if you have to squint. But this is the MBA forecast, very consistent, uh, very consistent with the the, uh, the the Moody's analytics forecast. And um, I just want to highlight a couple of things. The first underlying line is to look at 30-year fixed rate loans. Expected ended last year uh, just under three, expected to end this year in the mid threes, uh, expected to be up north of four next year and close to five the following year. Now, I say that to you because that's very consistent with where Professor Zandi is as well. Mike Frattentoni, the chief economist at the MBA, is one of the smartest economists in this nation. Uh, and his view is similar to literally any other economist you look at in terms of what's going to happen to rates. Now, four, four handles freak people out. Uh, but I just want to emphasize that uh, in a relative sense, four is still near historical levels. And so uh, don't worry about rates, worry about volume. And so if you look below that and look at mortgage origination volume, I just want to emphasize that while overall originations are going to drop. We did 3.8 trillion last year, expected to do about 3.6 trillion this year loaded in the first two quarters for the most part. Uh, next year's going to be a drop of $1.2 trillion all in refinances. In fact, if you look at purchases, just the line below that, uh, last year was 1.4. This year is roughly 1.7. Next year is roughly 1.7 and a half. Following year, 1.8. Steady, consistent increase in purchase activity, massive, significant declines in refis. In fact, 2.4 trillion in refis last year, uh, looking at roughly around 600 billion next year. And that's really going to be the challenge uh, for our industry. So let me close with this, guys. Um, we have years ahead of strong purchase demand. Uh, the reality is demographics matter. Um, uh, and that demographic slide should tell all. If I'm going out to realtors and home builders, I would share that slide and talk about what great years they have coming at them for, for years ahead. Great time to be in the business if you're in home purchase. Uh, new home building is only going to increase. We're already seeing it. Uh, new housing starts have been up and supplies costs are going down. I think we're going to see a different trend in listing volume. We're probably already seeing it a little bit uh, as we speak. Uh, but a lot of folks didn't list in a normal spring market this year because we were still masked. And uh, so this, uh, the view is by many that we're going to see a lot of homes come to market in the fall and next spring will be a really big listing volume of resales as people go to lock in equity and deal with the pent up demand that they didn't execute against, particularly retirees and baby boomers who are ready to move to a different environment. Uh, despite rates, demand won't slow. Um, you see that in every forecast, and, and including the ones I showed you. Um, sellers are going to get fast contracts at great prices. Buyers have years of home price appreciation ahead. I, th I think in the end, this is really about, for our industry, reinventing itself from some cases going back to basics. 
uh, and remembering what it's like to be solely a purchase loan originator and remembering that, uh, you know, we are what we repeatedly do. Uh, excellence is not an act, it's a habit. And in my view, uh, where the washout will come as the industry contracts will be from those that had too high a percentage of their business dependent on refinances and frankly, didn't invest the time to build relationships on the purchase side. It's still going to be a tough market. Margins are going to contract. Uh, but there will be winners and losers in our industry. Some companies that are centralized call center design that did nothing but refis, they're going to be hit a lot harder than what I hate to describe it any other way, but classic origination uh, street LOs that work relationships uh, with referral partners. And so that's kind of the scenario we are. I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. So Dave, um, man, there's a lot of good insight in that deck. Um, that one chart that you talked about on page 16, I think it was of the deck just showing the different generations and what's moving to that 34, 35. Yeah. That alone, to your point, if I were an originator today, that is the one slide of all that I would focus on just that with my referral relationships that drive purchase business to me, right? Yeah. To kind of walk through that. Because to your point, it's so funny. I've had so many conversations with people that talk about rates, right? And and, and I, as recently as two weeks ago, I was talking to real good friends of ours that are buying a place in New York. And the first thing they talked about was how do you do that for a living? Because getting a mortgage is impossible, right? They were talking about the... Yeah. Now, a, it's New York. B, they're buying in a co-op. So there's a lot more associated yeah, to it, right? Right. But the 200 pages of documents that they split and copied and FedEx it all over God's green earth, I think people are you know misguided in, in, in why things like that happen. But the idea of a rate going to four, to your point, I think scares the hell out of a lot of people that may be in the origination side of the house. Yeah. But in reality, I was taking notes while you're saying it, right? And I remember talking to you about this when I first got in the industry. If you go back over 40, 50 years, you know, six and a half, seven percent is the going 30 year fixed rate, right? Even with the historical lows that we've seen over the course of the last couple of years. Yeah, so Jeff, I'll tell you, I got my first home with a 13 and a half. Right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's all it's all a matter of, of perspective. But yeah, I mean, it does. I think I think what's going to happen in our business here. And I, I think it's scary for many LOs who, you know, got so used to this massive volume that we had over the last six quarters, five quarters. Um, and even your pipelines today are pretty full. And, yep. uh, and so thinking about that future and will it really happen? I'm hundred percent certain it's going to happen. The market is going to contract. This is a very abnormal period in our lives. Uh, and congratulations everybody for your success uh, that you've had and are having this month, but you need to, you know, our whole industry needs to retool and, um, I know, you know, one big money center bank um, that doesn't has retail loan officers, but they spent the last year, basically all their LOs refinancing their own book. Uh, they don't do a lot of purchase activity uh, because that's just not what they do for a living. I mean, typically, you know, brokers, uh, independent mortgage bankers are uh, do more loans per LO uh, than bank retail. And and so. Um, I think in the, as we think about how this is going to wash out, there's going to be some difficult rate baiting activity that's going to occur. People are going to be faxing to your realtors, the rates that seem impossible, originating at a loss, all of that kind of thing. And uh, I just think it's important to recognize that these are the last gasps of folks who have no other way to survive because they never really built the relationships or invested in what it takes to be uh, providing the kind of service that a real estate agent depends on. But I, let me just say this one point. Um, you know, a lot of real estate companies live and die on this kind of information. I literally got a call from a, uh, a senior executive at Compass. Next Wednesday, I'm doing uh, an event for multiple states of Compass, and it's going to be basically a deck like this, a little more retail realtor focused. Sure. Definitely that one slide is going to be in there. And um Information is power. Information gives you a reason to go talk to a realtor with something other than just what's today's rate That's uh, right. or what your niche product is. Everybody else already has that niche product. And uh, that's uh, right. You know, and so um, these are these are tools that you, you become a valuable source of information. 
And this is the kind of information that a real estate agent may say, hey, could you meet with my a client of mine? They're really afraid to go buy a home right now. They think this is going to slow down. This stuff could really help. I mean, that's where you end up becoming that needed partner. in Advisor. The Advisor, right, Dave? I mean, that's where you're not just a loan officer quoting rates and talking turn times and guidelines. You're actually bringing value to the relationship and you're an actual advisor. Right. No question. Yeah, it, it's funny. You, I wrote something you, you that I jotted something down that you, that you said, which was back to basics, right? Like, I think that's one of the things why we created this Flex series, right? It's not about Flagstar as a business partner and you know, the products that we offer, it's more about what value can we bring to our business partners, right? So right. having somebody like yourself, you know, come on and share this wisdom and this insight and this data, you know, again, it's not too late, right? That's the one thing I do want to make sure everybody understands, right? To your point, refis are still relatively strong. We've seen a trail off in refi applications week over week for a period of time, but they're still at pretty good levels. And, and to your point on the one slide, there is a lot of pent up equity that, again, as an advisor, if you're walking your client, your borrower through, you know, consolidation of debt, college education, insert, whatever that may be, there's an ability there to still provide value from a refinance transaction. But we've yeah. always said this, right? Purchase is the lifeline of your business, right? Rates are cyclical. This just happens to be a longer cycle than normal, right? And a period of time that we're going through. But purchase is the strong suit of what the foundation of your business should be. And and back to basics is that type of stuff, right? It's building the relationship, but how do you do that? You do it with yeah. information and knowledge. And, and the thing I, I constantly emphasize folks is whether the Fed tapers or not, it doesn't really matter because eventually we will have refied everybody who, who can get a three into a three and that's gonna be it or whatever the two and three quarters, whatever your number is today. That's right. All of them, everybody will have gotten the loan. The loans, will, there'll be less of them available. It'll be harder because uh, people didn't, you know, if they didn't do it before, there's oftentimes a reason for that. Uh, and um, and so it, we're going to reach what's called burnout. You burn out your coupons, the current coupon, uh, even if you keep rates level for an extended period of time. So, look, one way or the other, this market's shifting. It's still a great business. And um, I think it's really important for any, you know, mortgage broker, any loan officer who's looking at their own business everybody doesn't operate the same way, right? We're oversupplied with lenders and loan officers right now, but not all lenders are the same. Uh, some, as I said, are centralized call center refi operations, and they're just not going to do as well, right? Because uh, even to this day, we're not in a world where realtors are comfortable handing off their ho new home buyer to somebody on an 800 line on the other side. They like to know that the person they're working with they can trust and they're going to get the job done. So, um, you know, in that sense, I think just having a healthy view about a market shift and what you need to do as an individual to kind of reinvent yourself and your business model and, uh, and, 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 and don't let up. And, and John is, you know, as I taught you and I taught anybody who I ever taught in sales, re rejection is the game. Like a, right. lot of folks, a lot of folks can't handle rejection. Even a lot of top LOs have told me recently, they're, they don't want to go back out and beat the streets again. Uh, they just can't handle that. And I hate to tell you, that's the way sales happens, right? You go out and you talk to folks and you get rejected. Uh, but all you need is a couple of glimmers of hope uh, every day of someone who says, well, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll think of you next time. And if you that's can right. get first in line, uh, line of sight, the first person they think of when they get their next buyer or prospective buyer or whatever, um, you know, you'll be in a good place. But it's been a great couple of years and we should all relish in that. I just think understanding where we're heading going forward is important and knowing that the purchase market is not going to be the suffering point here. So as you talk to realtors, they're feeling good. That's uh, right. LOs in general are not going to be feeling as good because everybody did at least, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% of their business in refis, and that's going to be cut by two thirds. So that, that's right. And look, a couple of questions came in too, Dave. One of them was about the charts and stuff. So somebody asked a question if we'll be able to, to get this to them. The answer to that is yes, we have it. We'll make sure it gets out to you after we're done. Ryan Chambers from Midwest Capital Mortgage wrote um, curious to Dave's thought on 
if builders will be behind the eight ball for a while. I know we talked about labor and lumber and all that, but any thoughts on that from your perspective, Dave? Yeah, I mean, the builders, I, 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 there's some, there's two great resources for looking at builders. Ivy Zellman in New York, who she covers the building industry. She's, she and her firm are, are highly regarded in this space. And Zandi looks at them also, the whole team at Moody's Analytics. The building market will recover. Um, but you're right. We had a whole lot of things hit the building industry at one time, right? Statewide shutdowns and people couldn't go to work. So people just weren't hammering nails. Um, people weren't cutting trees. People weren't making cement. People weren't uh, producing metals. All of that is critical work that uh, built up inventories of goods that are used and needed to build homes. Second, which was labor. And I'm, this is not a political conversation, but I do, you know, whether you like it or not, doesn't matter. There's going to be 2 million more immigrants coming in per year uh, over the next few years than there were the last few years. A lot of that is manual labor. And uh, and those are people who can come in and, ha and hammer nails. I've got a guy builder here uh, near near me that talks to me all the time about his business. He's been building homes for 30 years. He has a set crew that comes in from mostly Mexico, but some from Central America, but they go home in the winters to be with their families. They couldn't get back in over the last couple of years. He lost his experienced trade skilled uh, workers that he needed to build homes. They're all here now, but you know, it's an interesting uh, dichotomy that we face when we try to mesh politics and policy with home building needs and, and good cost of goods and services. But I, I will say in the, in the end of the day, the builder, the simple answer is the building market's going to recover. It's going to be slower. And as, as you look at builder stocks and earnings releases, keep in mind guys, that they can't get homes to market and sold under the time frame that they may have promised or forecasted to their shareholders in a previous earnings release, right? So, if Tolbra or Pulte, you know, announces a forecast of X for Q3, but they still can't get these homes built completed because they didn't get the goods or the labor in time, that pushes out that sales volume. It's still going to close. It pushes it out, but the stock can get hammered as that's a result right. of not meeting uh, earnings expectations. So no, that's right. the way the business works. Yep. And then look, a couple more questions came through on the charts. I will tell anybody that's still listening, reach out to your account executive, right? That's gonna be whoever you're signed up with at Flagstar, reach out to them. They'll have access to this. They'll make sure it gets in your hands if you want it. Um, so please do that. Um, and, and Dave, before I thank you and, and let you go, I do want to give you a, a moment in time, right? So those of you that might not know you well enough or know you at, you know, at all, um, you know, obviously back in 2016, you got um, kind of a, a, you know, a health, crisis scare situation that came to you in the form of cancer. And I know you've started, um, Stephen Strong's been going on for a while right now, and there's been some exciting developments and stuff like that. So I wanted to give you a second just to talk about that um, with the group. Oh, thanks. Yeah, because we're, th thanks, John. We are launching our, uh, this is obviously a setup because the banner we already pre-made, but <laughs> the, the, uh, the uh, we are launching a, a fresh Stephen Strong drive. Uh, we launch it the day after Labor Day because uh, September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. I have the kind of can prostate cancer that's not curable. Um, uh, it's metastasized and similar to any cancer that metastasizes, which just means it's spread, whether it's breast cancer, geoblastomas or liver or whatever. You don't kill it. You just play a game of whack-a-mole uh, for years to come. And the good news is that there's, in some cases, there are medical advances. Um, the number one team in America that deals with this cancer is out of Johns Hopkins, Dr. Ken Pienta. Uh, and I started my first drive in 2016, my wife and I did. We've now done five years in a row uh, of drives. This is now the, technically the 2022 drive fiscal year. Um, but over the five years, we've, we've raised millions of dollars from the mortgage industry, literally millions of dollars, and I've bought allowed the Hopkins team to buy very sophisticated equipment that has made an outrageous breakthrough discovery. It's in that link. Uh, if you just go look at the site, it'll tell a little about it briefly. Um, that discovery is so exciting to the entire medical community that 40 researchers now have joined uh, Ken at Hopkins from other places. The, guy, the professor who old, holds the Einstein seat at Princeton University left Princeton to join Ken Pienta on this research. But what's great about our drive this year, uh, I call myself the little Susie G. Komen of the world. Um, 
uh, our Stephen Strong campaign has, ra has raised so much awareness that the Prostate Cancer Foundation, which is headquartered in California, uh, came out and said, we want to match Stephen Strong. And so dollar for dollar, they're matching our campaign. Um, and so we raise a million, they add a million. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity and every penny of every donation goes directly uh, to Dr. Pienta and his research organization, not for salaries, but for research. And uh, uh, so it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. Um, what he's discovered as in terms of why cancers spread and don't die from chemo and radiation the way sometimes you think they do is a cell called the keystone cancer cell. Well, they found that cell now in uh, breast cancer patients, in stomach cancer patients and more. Uh, and so this, 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 this unique element, if they can figure out how to kill it, which is this massive de development that never existed for decades in looking at this kind of cancer, uh, if they can now find a way to kill it, it'll apply to multiple cancers. And that's where all the excitement is. We launched a campaign this week. Uh, we've raised well over a million bucks so far, actually about 1.4 million, gotten $100,000 donations from CEOs of mortgage companies. And then rank and file LOs are doing, you know, $100, 500,000, whatever they can give uh, because it all goes to a great cause. And it's the mortgage industry doing this. So it's a, a real, very cool thing. Uh, if any you want to uh, participate, I'd love to get any support that you might consider. Yeah. And, and obviously, uh, you can get to it by the link that you see there. We'll make sure that gets out to everybody that attended as well. And look, the, the exciting thing when Dave was telling me about it earlier, right? Like he's going through it from a prostate perspective and he's been battling it since 2016. And just knowing Dave, you know, he's thrown himself completely into this, right? And, and, and as you heard, working with the team at John Hopkins and others. But the exciting part is how it's reaching out and, and with cancer in general, right? To breast cancer and all other forms of cancer. I think that's what, as I read it, that's what's really exciting. So what I would ask is, hey, if you have it in you, I mean, a lot of us have been infected in one way or another with family members, ourselves, or friends or family. It's a great cause. It goes all to the research. So at the end of the day, if you, if you have the ability to, please check that out. Um, yeah. And Dave, Hey, I can't say thank you enough. Appreciate all of the wisdom and, and the, and the feedback today. And look, it's never too late, right? Reinvent yourself today. I've been saying it for years. The time to build the realtor relationships and the purchase relationships is when you're going through a refi boom because nobody else is doing it, right. Dave talked about it's rejection. Sales is a numbers game. We know that, right? The more time somebody can say, no, you're putting yourself in a position for somebody to say yes. Right. But at the end of the day, also, improve your odds. Do it when everybody else is focused so much on their pipeline and slam with refis, and you are too, but carve out time to go after that purchase business and you'll, you'll set yourself up for future success. Dave, can't thank you again enough, buddy. Appreciate it. Great seeing you. Take care. Thanks, buddy. So, guys, appreciate you joining. Real quick, hopefully we can pull this up. Our next one uh, in October... Uh, and that will be October 14th, same time, same bat channel, second Thursday, every month, 2 p.m. Eastern. We have our own Jason Lee, who's our EVP of uh, secondary marketing at Flagstar. I will give a shameless plug. I've known Jason for a long time, and, and, and I believe he's one of our best minds uh, with inside the capital markets, secondary marketing, uh, with inside our industry. So, you know, sign up for that when you see it. Stay tuned. He's going to have some really good uh, insight into the future and what he believes from a capital markets perspective you should be thinking about. Um, but again, can't appreciate it enough for joining. Again, if you want any of the charts that you saw today, reach out to your account executive. Um, and, and as always, until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks for joining. Appreciate it.